You're listening to Seattle Real Estate Podcast. Hey, everybody. I'm Sean Reynolds, the owner of Summer Properties Northwest, Reynolds and Klein Appraisal, and your host for this episode of the Seattle Real Estate Podcast. So Washington is done with the stay home, stay healthy order. Now we're moving into safe start. That's the branding for Washington's phased reopening the Governor Inslee described as leaving one lifeboat for another. We just need to make sure it doesn't have any holes in it, he said. So I'm going to be walking through what phase 1.5 or modified phase 1 looks like because today is June 1st and we are no longer in the stay home, stay healthy order. So let's jump on in and take a look and see what we've got. So my first article is a, it's an article actually from the the Stranger and Stranger is kind of a alternative news source here in Seattle. I really enjoy it because it's always got some kind of off topic, wacky subjects and they've actually got some pretty good reporting and I enjoy seeing it. So Washington reopens gradually is the headline. Seattleites can get haircuts. Isn't that funny that the main thing that we're concerned about, I'm concerned about going to the gym And I figured to work out around that. But getting haircuts, that's another main thing. We just haven't been able to get a haircut. So we're not in the modified phase 1.5 yet, nor are we in modified phase 2. Because we've still got to, we've applied, I believe King County has applied for it. And we should hear this week, the first week of June, um, whether we can get into some of these modifications. And I'm going to be talking about the impact these modifications will have, what you'll be able to expect as far as businesses, what services you'll be able to now get, and how those businesses will operate. So let's jump on in. All right, so Governor Inslee announced on Friday that Washington will reopen with a county-by-county approach, and this was uh, written just days before the current stay-at-home order is set to expire. The order expired yesterday, and so now we're in kind of a new a new timeline. Starting on June 1 today, each county will start in its current phase. For example, King County, which is in phase one, will start in phase one. But county executives can apply to the Secretary of Health to move to the next phase. And from what I've read and what I believe, King County has already applied for, to the uh, Secretary of Health to move to modified phase one or phase two, whatever you want to call it, the new modification. All right, so in this proclamation, counties will have more flexibility to demonstrate that they have the capability to stay on top of the virus, Inslee said. Those decisions are started by the county, but whether or not shifts into new phases happen will depend on whether a county hits the necessary targets. Here are the targets. As far as COVID-19 cases are concerned, counties will need to report 25 or fewer new cases per 100,000 residents over a two-week period, as well as flat or decreasing hospitalizations uh, trends and a reproductive rate that's less than one. We don't talk about the last two things, but the first one is 25 or fewer new cases per 100,000 residents over a two-week period. That's kind of the big one. Before before last Friday, um, we were at 10 cases per 100,000 over a 14-day period. So we've bumped that up 2.5 times. And keep in mind, the governor has said that even though that is one metric that we kind of continually look upon, if our other metrics like the hospitalization trends and the reproductive rate, if those kind of offset a little bit of the 25 out of 100,000, if some of those metrics are better or worse, individual counties can apply based on the metrics they feel are there and can probably get some variance. So it's not set in stone is the bottom line. And I think what a lot of business owners are having a hard time with is which metric are we really using here? What can we count on to make decisions? Because if you're going to allow us to operate that XYZ percentage of our normal business, how long are we going to be set in these patterns like is it two weeks until we hit you know phase two if we're in phase one now or is it three weeks or is it two months and that's some of the frustration that business owners who are on the ground trying to make decisions are trying to figure out okay if i do this to make my business work in modified phase 1.5 if that only goes for two weeks and i don't make the money required uh, if i don't make up enough profit for the 
physical stuff I had to do to, to, to make my business work in that scenario, then is it even worth doing? Or do I just wait? If it's only going to be a couple of weeks till we go to phase two, do I just wait until we get there? Those are the things that are, I think, really confusing for small business right now is we're trying to track this moving target and these moving metrics of where we are. And I understand that the virus dictates where we are, which is what we're being told. But in reality, it's the Secretary of Health, isn't it? And the Secretary of Health clearly has the ability to say, yep, you can move to phase two, or nope, you're not there. And we'll get into where we are with counties here in Washington. Um, but that's kind of where we are is the, the main things are the cases, less than 25 cases per 100,000 um, for 14 days, a flatter decreasing trend in hospitalization and a reproductive rate. I don't even really know what the reproductive rate thing is, but it's definitely in there. And then there is healthcare system readiness. You've got testing, you've got case and contact investigation, you've got protecting high risk population. Those are all things that allow a county to move from one phase to the next. What we do know is that there's three weeks in between phases. That's kind of a known. But we're still, King County is still stuck in phase one. Other counties are either in applying or they're moving forward. And that's kind of what we're looking at. So here's, a, within this article, which, which is in The Stranger, they, and this is what I love about The Strangers, they throw in stuff. Here is a random tweet from Will James. He's known by, as at, at other Will James, that's his Twitter handle. Wild disparities in how close counties are to these targets. The average COVID-19 cases per 100,000 residents for May, uh, the period of May 10 to 23, Thurston had two. Grace Harbor had three. Pierce County had 20. Now, these are daily averages. Pierce County had a daily average of 20. King had 30, which is getting close to that 25, right? Kittitas had 92. So they obviously had a big spike. And then Chelan with 107. Yakima County, 481. What is going on over there in Yakima County? They're having just a massive outbreak. That's not massive, but relative, to obviously, to these other counties, they are they're getting hit by COVID. Um, so Inslee is relaxing a key criteria, the level of COVID-19 infection in the county. This is also by Will James. The target is now an average of 25 cases. Um, so an average of 10 cases per day, much less than 25. That's kind of the bottom line. So within King County, we are we're getting there. We're getting close. So is it going to be another couple of weeks before we have 25 or fewer cases over the next 14 days? Yeah, probably. But I know yesterday, yesterday was Sunday, March the 31st, and we had a big spike. We had a bunch of cases. But fortunately, this is on an average 14-day rolling period. Um, so continuing on with the article, additionally to qualify, counties will have to make sure that their hospitals have enough capacity and need to increase testing and report fewer confirmed COVID-19 cases. All right, and then we've got some stuff on contact tracing. Um, and then these are not individual requirements, but each will be evaluated in their totality is what the governor is telling us. So we can kind of take one piece and focus on that. Or we can take another piece, focus on that. And I think there's some leeway here. It's not absolute. That's what we're being told. For counties that don't quite hit these phase two requirements, there's an option for a modified phase one, phase 1 1.5. Like a phase 1.5, Inslee joked. And that's kind of what I'm going with because phase 1.5 is easier for me to understand for some reason. And that will be up to counties to decide what those modified phases look like. So individual counties are kind of being able to determine, all right, yep, I think we're close enough here. Let's go with modified phase 1.5. And here's what that looks like. So for King County, which is where Seattle and Bellevue are, King County Executive Dow Constantine announced that while King County does not qualify for phase two, restrictions on businesses and activities will be relaxed almost in accordance with phase two. So we've got this modified 1.5 or you know whatever we're calling it but it's almost like phase two so why do we have phase two it's kind of unclear so th the whole thing is kind of getting to be just a semantics in word is kind of my bottom line here but 
All right, let's keep going. So under a modified phase one or phase 1.5, gatherings in groups of five or fewer outside of the household are allowed. So maybe sometime this week in King County, we're going to be able to do that. Restaurants can only have 50% of capacity outdoor only. So you've only got outdoor seating uh, for restaurants. But at least you've got outdoor seating. All right, we'll get into that later. But um, and other businesses will allow opening with reduced capacity, such as only allowing 15% of occupancy for retail going into stores, hair salons and barbers will be open too. And they will need to abide by phase two guidelines as well. But at least we're probably going to see some of these things open up granted at limited capability. And that's what I want to kind of focus on towards the end here is, all right, for so many of these businesses, they're barely making it go at full capacity. You open them up at 15 or 20 or 25 or maybe 50% capacity, they're still not making money. So do these stores open up? Do they ramp up to get opened? Or do they hunker down until they've got greater capacity in a later phase? That's what I think a lot of business owners, those are the decisions that are that are being made right now. And such a difficult time because we've got, and I haven't mentioned it, but we've had all of these uh, protests we had peaceful protests, and then we've had, you know, some looting and some rioting and graffiti and all kinds of crazy stuff. Even here in Bellevue, in you know, sleepy Bellevue, we've had uh, last night. I was out for a couple hours just seeing what's going on, because as the host of the Seattle Real Estate Podcast, I need to be able to tell somebody, you know, it's not what I heard about the rioting of the protest, but I saw it. So that's what I did, and. Um, with all of this other stuff going on, with businesses trying to figure out what's going on, the impact of these riots and the protests, those are kind of on people's minds too, because does it make people want to stay home even further? Well, with the folks that I saw rolling around after the peaceful protests happened, um, these, were not, these were not people that are local. These are outside people from somewhere. And yeah, they did have weapons. And yeah, they blew up a truck that I saw. I saw a truck on fire. I saw graffiti, I saw storefront smashed, I saw uh, landscaping pots destroyed in, in, in the street. Um, a lot of stuff going on that makes everybody feel, oh my gosh, what is going on? And so it's, it's an uncertain time and for a small business to try and guess, hey, are people going to want to come out during all of this? It's an unknown. We don't really know. So it's kind of one more variable and just this enormous string of what is going on with our society and with, with our marketplaces, um, especially when small business is concerned. All right, but there's, I mean, you got to like the fact that we've got hair salons and barbers are going to be open soon. So if you can hang on, on, I think, another week. What I've read in other articles is that um, we have applied, King County has applied for modified phase one, and it should be just a matter of days before we'll, we'll be able to go into that. So keep watching Governor Inslee's uh, daily newscasts. I know he's got another one set for today, June 1st at three o'clock. I didn't catch what it was on, but I usually try and cap catch a recap so that I know, so I can tell people, hey, I didn't hear it from somebody else. I heard it from the governor and here's where we are. So we're not out of the woods yet. Um, King County Executive Dow Constantine said, this is a big step in the right direction. We'll be monitoring our progress over the course of two weeks. All right, that's fair. Uh, if everything checks out, more businesses and activities will come back. And so it's kind of this phased reopening that we've got going on here. Currently, there are around 26 counties already in phase two in Washington. Those counties can apply to transition to phase three after three weeks in phase two. The earliest that any county would get to phase three is June 3rd. And those are the counties that had relatively few cases and very few deaths. And those are typically on the perimeter of uh, the outside of Washington state. They're not on the interior where all the population centers are. At any time, if things take a turn for the worse, a county can request to roll back to a previous phase or restrict some activities again. The Secretary of Health can make that call as well. So it kind of goes both ways. So county officials are able to make a call and also the Secretary of Health for the state can say, yeah, you know what guys, this is not great. And I forget what county it was. Was it a county in California that went back or maybe Ohio? 
But somebody, uh, I guess maybe didn't go back, but they went under lockdown again. They're like, oh, this is not working out in our favor. Let's lock this puppy down again. And because uh, we're, we're exposing ourselves to some pretty major uh, infection rate here. So that is, I think that's it for the stranger that I'm going to look at. All right, and this is coming from the Seattle P uh, Post Intelligence, sir. So the second phase involves the reopening of restaurants, hair and nail salons, and retail stores at limited capacities. Phase two also means people can gather in groups of five or fewer and resume some outdoor activities such as camping. So what I have seen with the whole, I'm a big go to the gym guy. Obviously, that's just my thing. Um, and as ridiculous as it is, that's what I kind of like to do. And uh, so we can gather in groups of five or fewer. So we're trying to figure out what does that mean? So you can exercise in groups of five or fewer. So can we get into one of the rooms at my gym and exercise in groups of five or fewer? I don't know. We'll probably get direction on that. But big, big picture with all the protests going on and rioting and all that stuff, whether or not I can go to the gym, that's kind of insignificant. It's totally a first world problem. But it's, it's there. Throughout the second phase, residents are still asked to limit non-essential travel and to follow social distancing guidelines. All right. The third phase includes the opening of gyms and movie theaters at reduced capacities, along with libraries and museums. Those are gatherings of, uh, of a group of 50 or more. Several counties still remain far from meeting the new criteria needed to move forward with, with, with reopening. In all, King County has reported 7,949 confirmed cases of the virus, including 564 deaths. Over the 14-day period from May 14th to May 27th, the county reported 560 new cases, or about 26 per 100,000 people. So we, I believe King County is on the cusp of going to phase two, but like with the spike we had yesterday, we're not probably gonna be there like in the next week. I'm thinking maybe within the next two weeks we get there. And for other counties that are on the on the line, but 26 cases per 100,000 people. I mean, that's pretty darn close to 25, right? But I think the county officials are like, all right, yeah, but the trend here, as we've seen kind of this up and down numbers on the cases. So let's, we, we know people need haircuts and we know they need all this other stuff. So let's figure out a way right now where we can get there. And I think that's what's happening this week, the, the week of June 1st. Uh, other areas in the region, such as Yakima County, have seen surges in recent weeks in the number of positive cases of the virus. Yakima County now has the second most confirmed cases in the state with 3,231 and more than 100,000 cases reported in the previous uh, 14 days. A thousand, did I say 100,000? That's not right. I'm pretty sure I said 1,000 cases, but you know, when you read and you hear something in your head and you got your phones on, you just don't know. So uh, Yakima had 1,000 cases reported in the previous 14 days. So what's going on in Yakima County? That's just, they've just got some, they got the Rona there. So hopefully they can get that under control and um, move forward like King County hopefully will. All right. So we are going to go through kind of the bigger counties now, and I'll kind of give you a rundown on where we sit. On Friday, King County announced plans to apply to the move to the modified phase one. That's where King County is, and that's what we've been talking about. Snohomish County, uh, Snohomish County officials this week announced, and that's the county right to the north of King County. Snohomish County officials this week announced plans to apply to move to phase two. They are there. They're ready to apply. Go Snohomish County. Pierce County, between May 14th and May 27th, the county reported 146 positive cases of the virus, about 17 cases per 100,000. They now meet the target to move to phase two. Pierce County, let's see you do it. Skagit County, that's a county north of Snohomish County, so two counties up from King. Skagit County has had a total of 430 confirmed cases of the novel coronavirus, including 15 deaths. On Friday afternoon, Skagit County officials announced plans to apply to move to phase two. You can do it, Skagit. Whatcom, Whatcom County, and that is one north of Skagit, I believe. Whatcom County now has fewer than 25 cases per 100,000 people and could apply to move to the next phase. You can do it also, Whatcom. And then Okanagan County and a bunch of other counties, they're close. Um, depending on where they're at, and they're kind of making decisions. So a lot of the counties are already, I think two-thirds of the counties are already in phase two, and the bigger counties, obviously, they're not just not quite there yet per the requirements. All right, so now I'm going to get into 
The modified phase one could include the following phase two activities with the specific modifications to the previously issued health and safety requirements listed below. And now I am reading from um, the governor.wa governor site, and this is direct from the source. So that's why I wanted to read the way that modified phase one goes. Recreation and fitness in modified phase 1.5. Uh, only outdoor activities with five, we read this before, not including the instructor or fewer people outside of the household. So you can do some stuff outside, but don't go more than five. Recreation uh, gatherings, only allowed outdoor of five or few people outside of the household. Additional construction, as outlined in phase two guidance. So construction will move ahead. I don't know a ton about that, but whatever is in phase two. Manufacturing operations, as outlined in phase two guidance, all right? Real estate, 25% of building occupancy, indoor services limited to 30 minutes. So real estate brokers out there, 25% of building occupancy. So your managing broker is gonna need to figure out, you may not know what your occupancy is, but now you're gonna need to figure that out because you gotta keep it 25% or less. So does that mean you maybe have a schedule for people to come into the office? Some of Properties Northwest, we do all of our work remotely. We do very little in office, so it's kind of a non-factor for us. Um, and indoor services limited to 30 minutes. Keep it under 30. In-store retail, 15% of building occupancy. This does not apply to currently operating essential retail, such as grocery stores. Currently operating essential retail should continue to follow the phase two requirements. So if you are retail and you are in business now, you just got to follow the, the uh, phase two requirements. Uh, that's once we go to phase 1.5. I know this is confusing, but stick with me. Indoor services are limited to 30 minutes, and that's for in-store retail as well. So here's where it starts to get tricky. 15% of building occupancy. How much are these little retail shops? How much occupancy do they have total? I know some stores are they're really small. So are they going to be able to have like one person in the store at a time? Probably. So can a retail store open up, have the personnel in there, cover their overhead with having a maximum of one person in the store at a time? I don't know. Those are the hard decisions that business owners are going to have to make. And I guess it kind of comes down to, obviously it comes down to what you are selling. So if you're selling a ton of stuff, if you're a high volume sales, per, sales company and you're only allowed one person in there at a time, there's going to be a lot of times where there's not even one person in there. So you got zero occupancy. Can you afford to keep your store person in there, keep the lights on, utilities going, all those other expenses that that uh, require retail to operate. And so th those are questions I think that business owners are like, man, I know we can open up, but I don't know financially if we can. All right, let's move on to the next one. This is everybody's favorite, personal services. That's your haircut, that's your esthetician, that is your tattoo artist, that's your hair dye person, nail person, all that. It's under personal services. And I did a video on personal services and uh, professional services, which is just people in offices, did a podcast on that, kind of what that looks like for phase two. Check that out if you want. So personal services, 25% of building occupancy. All right, so I've kind of been doing the numbers in my head for my salon to open up, I mean, that is going to be slim. We don't have a lot of seats. I go to the men's salon at Bell at Jean Juarez here. It's kind of a local um, longtime business. And I go to the guys' salon. They have a separate salon for the guys. They have beer on tap. It's pretty awesome. I never do that, but I should just because I can. But um, they're only going to have maybe, I'm guessing, maybe two guys in there at a time. And for the amount of cleaning that the salons have to do in between each customer, it is onerous. It is crazy how much cleanup and stuff that they're going to have to hit in between customers. I read through it and it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's mind blowing what they have to do. And on the professional services too, uh, companies that are office, op, operating office space, what you've got to do is, is pretty phenomenal as far as the amount of work just to keep things at the safety levels that phase two are going to require. 
All right, so personal services, 25% of building occupancy. Professional services, again, that's office space. Let's just call it office people. 25% of building occupancy. All right, so we can figure out how to do that. So bigger offices are going to be in a better situation with fewer people, obviously. How does that work with like co-working spaces like WeWork? I don't know. Um, they're going to have to figure the numbers out, run the numbers, and go from there. Indoor services will be limited to 30 minutes for customers on professional services. So you got an appointment with somebody, limit it to 30 minutes. I kind of wonder, not 40 minutes, but 30, not 20, but 30. Who came up with that number? And is it really based on anything? Or, hey, is it just, let's figure out a number where we think people can get stuff done? Because on professional services, for a lot of meetings, you're going to spend the first 10 minutes just chatting about nonsense and then you got 10 minutes to wrap up you got 10 minutes to actually get your your thing done a lot of professional services you need way longer than that an hour um, but all right so under covid we're gonna have to go with 30 minutes so photography photography is outlined in phase two guidance um, i'm not sure why that's a separate deal but is that in a studio or what's going on there i don't really know i haven't really looked into photography but i'm sure somebody will let me know in the comments in-home domestic services as outlined in phase two guidance. So I, I think house cleaning is already going. I think house cleaning was going as of like May 11th. But I'm guessing this is nanny services and those kind of things. I really should look up on that more. But I'm more of a business office guy and I don't have any kids uh, at home anymore. So just don't worry about that. Pet grooming, 25% of building occupancy. Aren't there just basically pets in there most of the time? And pets don't really, they don't really transmit COVID. So I don't know. I'm not trying to be a Debbie Downer here, but uh, some of this stuff just seems kind of crazy. Obviously, I know it's 25% of building occupancy for people, but for pet groomers, they just have customers come in, drop the dog off, the cat off, get a haircut, whatever it is they do. Uh, all right. So the, here's the big one. Restaurants. And we already talked about it, but I'm going to go through it again. No indoor dining allowed. And I was debating with the guys here earlier, why no indoor and why outdoor? Does the wind carry the COVID away when you're seating outside? Do you feel people just feel better? Is it a better way to introduce people to dining just outside? Here's the thing. In, in early June in Washington, we can still have terrible weather for a couple-week run. So if we have great weather like we're having today, it's blue skies with a little bit of clouds, super pretty, and it's probably in the mid-60s, I'm guessing. If that's the case, we have that for the next couple of weeks, restaurant owners are fine. But if restaurant owners are worried about all these protests going on, what the impact is going to be there, they're worried about people coming out of their homes after the stay home, stay safe is over. They're trying to judge what the demand is going to be. And they're also looking at the weather. So this is another thing that restaurants have to focus on now, because so far, all this stuff, I think you can operate pretty well. You don't really care what the weather is, except for the outside exercise. And if people really want to exercise, they're going to figure out the one hour window in the day where they can go out there. Whereas restaurants, if you have no indoor dining, and you're dependent upon the weather, if it's raining, and you've got, if you put a couple of grand into your outdoor seating, and that doesn't happen for like two straight weeks, because you have crappy weather, you know, you got to have a couple of days in Seattle or Bellevue to get people to go outside because people are like, you know, it poured yesterday. Odds are today it's, it's probably going to be crappy. So we need a couple of days of good weather to kind of get that rotation of people getting used to thinking, all right, let's go outside. So small business and especially restaurants with no indoor dining allowed. I think that's a difficult one. So what they are offered is outdoor dining is permitted, but seating at 50 percent of existing outdoor capacity. Most restaurants already have pretty limited outdoor seating capability in Seattle because it's crappy here most of the year round. And so to limit outdoor seating for dining at 50% of existing outdoor capacity, so you've already got really small outdoor seating areas for most restaurants, and that's if they happen to have outdoor seating. My friend Dan, who I've talked about a million times, had him on the podcast here as a great example of trying to get to bar and grills through coronavirus shutdown. He's got outdoor seating capacity at the Savage Moose in Kenmore, Washington, but does not have any outdoor seating capacity as of yet 
with his bar in uh, Bellevue, which is off the rails. And that's just the way, you know, they're situationally sit sitting with parking lots and, hey, they already had this outdoor seating area or, you know, previous owner applied to the city for outdoor seating area. So he's got a little bit of capacity um, at the Savage Moose, but none at his other bar. And in order to make it viable to open up, he needs to probably create some more, more outdoor seating and that, and he can do that, but it's going to cost some money. So is he going to sink money into a short-term temporary solution for an un unknown variable of, is he going to make the money back? He doesn't know. And that's, that's the hard call that I'm seeing these business owners make is, all right, we've got these modifications and I can run with them, but does this make financial sense? And for most of these things, I think business owners are going to go, yeah, probably not. Or they're going to go, you know what, this is a dry run. Maybe I break even on this phase of the recovery, but I'm going to get back up and running. Maybe this is a loss leader for when I'm more set up and ready to roll in phase, you know, fully phase two or phase three, when things become less and less onerous. Maybe it's a situation that that's where we're at is, hey, I know I'm going to lose money, but I'm going to cover some overhead and I'm going to get the ball rolling so that once we are to the next phase where I think we'll actually make money, we're not kind of starting from zero. We've got a little bit of that momentum going. And I think that's where a lot of companies are, they're trying to judge and they're trying to estimate, how do I get there? Because I've been shut down. And a lot of these companies have the PPP money, but in order to spend it, they need to spend it on payroll. Now, though, we are going to get a variance on that. I think the Senate will vote on that this week. I'm hoping the House has already passed it. And that would extend the PPP loans, the Paycheck Protection Program, from basically 56 days to 24 weeks. And that would allow most small businesses to spend that money and allow that to go from a loan to a grant, which means they don't have to pay it back. So you take it from eight weeks to 24 weeks. Now the PPP really makes sense and people can use that in their advantage. The problem is, is that businesses who already started getting their money shortly after the April 3rd application process, they've already spent half, two thirds, three quarters of their money. Maybe they've come close to spending it all because I think the first companies that are allowed to apply for forgiveness on the PPP, they are eligible, I think, sometime this week. Uh, April, May, June. Yeah, no, maybe it's next week, something like that. And it depends on when you got your payout on the PPP. So a lot of businesses are trying to figure out, all right, maybe I open up some more and I can burn up some money. But now that is going to be changed by law. And so we're going to wait for that law to be passed. And so then I can spread out my money. It's just all this complex stuff. And business owners just trying to figure out which way is up. So hang in there. We do have forward progress. Even though phase 1.5 isn't phase two, it isn't exactly what we wanted. I think it's a good move in the right direction. Individual businesses are going to have to figure out how to make it work, just like trying to get through how to make it work in a shutdown where you don't have any income. So if you find this content uh, helpful, I would love to have you subscribe to our YouTube channel, Summer Properties Northwest. Love to have you subscribe. Hit the like on this video. Hit the notification bell so each time we have something come out, you get notified and you want to watch it. On our podcast platform, thanks so much for downloading our podcasts. We're doing a daily podcast, and I think we're going to keep doing daily podcasts moving forward. We've had a ton of traction uh, from our podcasts and just, I think, getting the repetitions in. This is one of those things where I hopefully get better each one that I do. I learn from my lessons. I look at previous podcasts and go, wow, that was really crappy. Or why did I say that? That was terrible. Or this camera angle needs to get better. All those things are hopefully working in our favor and we're getting better um, at what we do. So thanks so much for tuning in. We appreciate it. We can't do it without the viewers and the listeners. So again, thanks so much. I'm Sean Reynolds from Summit Properties Northwest, Reynolds and Klein Appraisal, and I will see you on the next one. We'll catch up then. All right. Bye-bye. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and hit the notification bell so you'll know when our next video is out.